Justice Fred Marchant, who in 1970 became one of the first officers ever to be honorably discharged as a conscientious objector from the United States Marine Corps. That experience has profoundly shaped his life and his writing, which has the wonderful ability to be both fiercely honest and elegant, compassionate and insightful. No matter what the topic, his sister's illness, war, or entering a men's prison, Fred is able to love this flawed world and find humanity and warmth where others see only darkness. Fred Marchant is a professor of English and director of the Creative Writing Program and the Poetry Center at Suffolk University. He is also a longtime teaching affiliate of the William Joyner Center for the Study of War and Social Consequences at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Fred is the co-translator of From a Corner of My Yard, poetry by the Vietnamese poet Chan Dong Qua. He has also published three books of poems. His most recent collection, The Looking House, has received rave reviews from the Christian Science Monitor and the Irish Times. Fred, it's wonderful to have you here. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Would you open with the poem? I would be delighted to. The poem I'm going to read is called um, A Place at the Table, and it's in The Looking House, the most recent book. A place at the table. It means you can face your accusers. It means there is no place to hide. It means you will not drift off to sleep or carve your name on your arm or give anyone here the finger. It means you do not have to wave your hand as if you were drowning. It means there is nothing here that will drown you. It means you really do not have to have the answer. Since there are only a few of you left sitting across from you, it means you can study their faces as you would the clouds outside. You will not totally forget them. It means you are now, roughly, for a while, just about equal. In the center before you, there is nothing unless someone gives it. It means that when you are gone, everyone feels it. It means that when you leave, you feel as if you haven't, that you still have a place at the table. Later in your life, this moment will return to you as a moat of dust that floats, floats in on the spars of sunlight. It will search every room until it finds you. Mm. I remember the first time I read that poem, I heard myself gasp because I thought, oh, there's such wonderful reassurance in this poem, yet also the reminder that there is a responsibility to the people around you. And the poem doesn't just stop at a single moment. It really is about your connection to others and to points in time. The mm -hmm. past and the present mm -hmm. are connected. The present and the future are connected. So that's what really struck me about that poem. And in many ways, that's what all of your poems seem to do for me. That's, that's beautifully said. And, and I'm glad, actually. It's very pleasing to hear you say that. Um, what strikes me about it as I read it you know, at this instant is that it is a relatively abstract poem, and not a poem that that's just a description, but rather some, some strange sort of situation or many situations that have been sort of, you know, la laminated or uh, layered on top of one another, like the way a map can have an overlay. The, mm -hmm. the lines themselves are like that. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're layered on each other. And yet, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that the, the, 
the, the poem has a kind of, you know, forward movement, you know, towards something strange. And as you said, I think, toward a sense not only of, you know, the decency of connection, but the possibility of a future mm -hmm. that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And that strangely enough, even the motes remember, mm -hmm. you know. Well, what I love about your work is that you are such an astute and trustworthy witness. And so I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about what being a witness means to you and how is it different from being a conscientious objector? That's, that's a wonderful question, rich with many avenues to go down. The, the word witness always uh, sort of resonates for me um, with a lot, of, um, a lot of unexpected components. You know, for instance, uh, You'll ask trial lawyers or judges, and they'll all say that, well, of course, eyewitnesses are the most unreliable sorts of witnesses. And so I always think that the word witness, in a real sense, is not merely the observer, you know? And then I think about the word wit, which I always love. But I, whenever I think of the word witness, and it's so serious, and it's got all the religious connotations, especially in the Christian tradition. But when you think of the word wit, how interesting that word is. We think of it as sort of having a sense of humor or sharp edge or some kind of irony. But deep down inside that word in its etymological history is a, is a sense of knowing. In fact, I think that the, the most ancient root is, it goes to the, um, uh, the Indo-European roots, and, 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 and the same root is used in the Vedas, the first poems that people know of, uh, and, it, and it means knowing in a holy sense, capital H, I guess. And, and I like the way in which that word plummets us into knowing the world with that kind of, um, what should we say, presence and putting yourself there mm -hmm. and being present to the world. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that relate to a conscientious objector? I, mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, the truth of the matter for me is that, that wherever, wherever one knows something and decides that it's something you can't participate in or you want to oppose or resist, well, it's sort of on a continuum. You move through that knowing and then it sort of becomes, you know, almost natural, <laughs> almost, you know, almost you just step one, one color of the rainbow to the next and there you are. And so for me, uh, the conscientious objector um, moment in my life had a lot to do with starting to realize what I was doing, gradually, gradually realizing that I was participating in a war that was wrong and that, um, and that actually could, could resist it too, mm -hmm. even in the military. Now, how did that experience of war and witnessing some horrific scenes, how did that affect you and how did poetry help you begin to heal from that? Um, that's, that's, that too is one of those questions that the, the avenues open up around it. Let, let me, you know, there's a real tradition of, um, of people who have had to be careful about um, how they present themselves in relation to war. It's so easy to make every story a war story and sort of get an accidental glory from it. And so I'm going to be very precise in what I say to counter that. First of all, the, I, when I was a, in the Marine Corps, I was in Okinawa in the Ryukyuan Islands, and that was the staging area for the Marine Corps going into Vietnam, but it wasn't combat. And so in a certain way, I was privileged, you know, to reflect on what I was doing before I was supposed to go down into uh, Vietnam. And then secondly, um, you know, the terrible truth is, is that I was witness to a terrible scene, that, that I, I with the help of some interviews in the past, I realized that probably the first time I ever thought about um, objecting to the war, I didn't know quite what I would do, was when the, the Seymour Hirsch articles and the photographs about the My Lai massacre became available. It was the last weekend of November 1969, just for the record. And, um, and I, I can remember when I first uh, saw those photographs, um, I was in my office, and I was the deputy chief of police. Uh, it was, that's another long story, but just suffice it to say, I had an office, and I had stateside magazines coming to that office 
uh, all the time. And I turned the page, and when I saw those p photographs of those um, women and children and old people uh, murdered, I looked up at the ceiling uh, and declared myself to myself and no one else that I was not a Nazi. And what I meant by that was that that's all I knew. In, you know, that was my moral compass, that this is not what, what we as Americans should be doing. This is what the Nazis did. And that was the beginning of mm -hmm. my objection. After? You asked, yes. Mm, yes. About feeling. <laughs> well, language, of course, is one of those things that does have the capacity um, to make whole what's been, you know, fragmented terribly. In fact, the, working with language is always some sort of, you know, composition. You're putting something together. And it may be to represent fragmentation, but still, the act itself is, a, is, is, is composition. And so um, I always think it's healthy. Even when it's miserably difficult, I think it's healthy. And it's healing, and it, and it helps with those, those things. But there's more to be said about it than that. Because all, there are all kinds of languages, and there are all kinds of ways to use language. Why poetry? And it seemed to me, and it always seemed to me as a young person, when I first discovered poetry when I was a freshman in college, uh, I thought this is really unbelievably great uh, to see what language, to see the, the way language can do things that I had never thought possible. And when I w wave my hand and say that, I, what I mean is that, that to reach outward and inward, both, you know, to, to levels of, of meaning and feeling and that I only dimly, or was only dimly aware existed in the world or in me, and, and to find that um, those dimensions made available through language was, you know, was a, a widening of my horizons as a human being. When I entered into the military, I had, I did it as a very naive and callow, you know, young man who thought he would go and write about it. I didn't. I didn't write anything about it until the mid 1980s. Uh, honestly, it, it sort of it, it sort of was beyond language for me. Um, but I wrote poetry anyway, and that, in the way I look at my life now, I can see I was working my way toward that. And so that in my very first book, that was when I could do that and when I could I could write about domestic violence. I could talk about violence at all. Um, I, I, I was ready to, for my first book, but, but I, was in, I was in training for about 20 years to get ready to do that, and it began uh, that day in November in 1969. Mm. Well, you spoke earlier about knowing, and you mentioned the presence, and so that made me think of something that really strikes me about your work, and that is a sense of the sacred. And that leads me to wonder, hmm, some poets believe that poetry is a form of secular prayer. Mm -hmm. Is it secular prayer for you? I really like the idea of having secular and prayer put together. And I love, I, I know what prayer is, I think, you know, in a practical sense. Uh, I was brought up a Roman Catholic, and so I have an inheritance of the sacramental, the, the ritual, too. and. Um, and I was thinking the other day that I simply would not be the same poet anyway had I not heard so many years of Latin that I didn't understand as a child just to hear the rhythms. I, I was, it was an accidental education in, in poetic rhythm um, and listening only to sound and to feel the sacred in sound alone. Um, However, secular prayer is a, a complicated matter. I think it cuts both ways, you know. I think prayer always has a secular dimension to it. Real prayer is always about something, something human, mm -hmm. something that is needed, or some lamentation. And so that it's rooted in life as lived, you know, outside of institutions even, you know. And, and prayer doesn't depend on any formal um, enterprise, you know a theology or a church or whatnot. On the other hand, um, poetry, um, I think sometimes, not always, but, but sometimes works toward that state of, um, of intensity, of language and feeling, of, of aspiration, of hope that there is the possibility that there's a 
spiritual dimension to life that it's worth saying it out loud or speaking to and that you hope there's you know some intuitive um, recognition on the part of existence that this is worthy in fact as I said that just then that was a pretty good definition of poetry too wasn't it you know prayer so I do see them as sort of speaking back and forth through each other and that prayer is certainly poetic poetry does you know have the motions of prayer at times I don't want to forget however the really worldly dimensions of poetry I mean there's some great curses in poetry and there's of course body poetry you know and, and all of that stuff of life that one has to remember now I happen to think that a really great set of curses verges on the holy that it actually gets you to a point where you're really thinking about wow that's a real curse and likewise in the other sort of more you know uh, the erotic, you know, as you know, many poets in the past have, you know, embodied this. The erotic does, you know, sometimes bring us to this larger sense of union, um, you know, beyond the self, you know, not no longer confined to the single life you live in a way. Um, and satire, you know, the nastiness of satire sometimes, you know, to me anyway, has the kind of virtue of a of a good secular sermon, you know. Mm -hmm. So it sounds as though it's important to be a witness to all kinds of human experiences, all kinds of emotions and uses of language, even if the nuns and the priests might not agree with that. Sure. I do, I think, I don't think one has to go out of one's way too much mm -hmm. to cultivate that experience. I think one gets, one lives. And then living in this world, you know, it's really important not to, um, well, how should we say it? This is a, came to mind. Well, it's important not to wear blinders. Well, we all know that, but it's, it's worse than that. It's important not to, um, you know, not to, really try not to see and sometimes you know we all are human and sometimes we really flinch mm -hmm. and uh, and it's a spiritual discipline not to flinch and poetry is one of those spiritual disciplines I realize that I'm accidentally talking about the title of, of the looking house in a way because it's one that the idea of that title is that is that the, there are shelters which allow us to see to really see in the midst of a lot of chaos you know and I think that's, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Beautifully put. I love that idea of it being a spiritual discipline not to flinch. It's also a poetic discipline. Mm -hmm. So when you are in the classroom mm. and you are being a witness of a different kind right. there, how do you help people understand that it's important not to flinch? You, you've, you've really put your finger precisely I think on one of the you know one of the great um, and I think deeply moving dimensions of real education and I mean teaching and learning both um, it's that it's the sense that somehow that it is important to learn to see is what is needed I'm, I'm, I'll start teaching a course in about 10 days and, and it's a course on modern American poetry and, and I will ask everyone you know why they're there and then I'll say why I'm there you know and and one of the reasons that I will say is that 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 reading carefully these poems teaches me how to see teaches me how to hear teaches me more about feeling regions of feeling that oh I may have been dimly aware of and then oh I recognize that you know and that so that the practice of reading um, you know good poetry really carefully is in some way the practice of reading what experience and the inner life and the broader sense of things really carefully mm -hmm. and so um, I don't know if I'm you know absolutely right in that you know it's a, it's an act of faith on my part too I hope that's the case I wish often that um, there'd be more you know absolute sort of certitude in the matter um, but then again you know you come across something and, it, and it, a piece of poetry that just suddenly illuminates experience for you and you know that that's what you seek when you you know when you do this practice or, or witnessing on behalf of poetry 
Well, one of the things I love about your poetry is that there is such a warmth to it. And even when you're describing some very grim situations, there's always a sense on the reader's part that you love this world and that you see something of value in every situation. I'm wondering, is it sometimes a discipline to maintain that sort of warmth and optimism? Because the world can really test you at times. That's, that's a really extraordinarily important and beautiful um, question. It's a great observation about the poetry that I've written. I, until you say it, I don't recognize it. And then I, as soon as you started explaining the sentence, I said, oh, it's true. I do. <laughs> I do think that it is, um, it is part of the, of the vocation, if you will. Um, to, to love, and by, by that I mean embrace, bring to oneself or give oneself to uh, the, the world and the, the moment we have in it. And so if there is that, you know, that, um, that undertone or overtone, I don't know which, in the, my poetry, uh, I'm, I'm enormously grateful. It is earned, I try hard to, um, I try hard not to sort of, you know, just for the sake of some sort of gesture, um, oversimplify things. Um, and and I, I'm hesitant right now because I am thinking of, of another poet that um, I'm going to put myself in the company of, but very humbly, okay? But, you know, as soon as I started to talk in response to your question, I started to think, well, you know, there are some models of this, and Walt Whitman is, of course, the great American model, where, um, you know, one can get irritated at his affirmations, right? On the other hand, when, when he does swing through experience, and he, he takes these long, sweeping glances, and then starts layering them, right? And you do sense that this, that this is the practice of his poetry. That, that any given moment, of course, is you know, an artful moment, but that there is a great heart that's driving that poetry. And it's not a heart that is different from yours and mine, but, but a heart that's been made more available to language and language to it and imagination to, I don't want to skip that, you know, make it all in the chest, but still, mm -hmm. there is that sense that, 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 that he positioned himself in, the, in, the, in such a way as to embrace the world, even with its painful dimensions. And not to, not to somehow pretend they aren't painful either, mm. you know? So if I have even, even a tiny sliver of that, um, then I will be very happy, you know? Well, in my humble opinion, there's more than a yeah. sliver there. And your work for many young writers is probably going to be the kind of model that Whitman has been for you. Uh, thank you. That's, well, that would be a, I would, I'm happy to, see, to, to imagine that. It is true that, that, that young, younger writers, all writers, need other writers. Mm -hmm. And it's very much a part, one is very much a part of a, of a, of a broader enterprise than the simple, single individual. Um, I'm always struck by, by how absolutely essential to my growth as a human being and as a writer, other writers have been, mm -hmm. and other writing, I might add. Would you read another poem for us? I will. I'm going to read one of those poems that, um, that I hope does a little bit of, um, it's a harsh scene, but it's not a, I mean, it's, yes, it's harsh and no, it's, 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 you know, it's quite human. It's, it's also another slightly abstract poem, but, but I can tell you the, the, the nature of this abstraction will come clear very quickly. It's called the drum room, and the drum room in some prisons is that room where uh, when visitors are going into the prison, that, that they enter and then the door shuts behind and another door opens mm -hmm. after they've been inspected. And so this is the drum room. The drum room. The door you come through slams shut before the door you go to 
opens. A last stopping place, a once over from the guard behind his tinted glass. Your pockets are empty, wristwatch in the locker with wallet and change. Two pens, a notebook, a wish to act normal and show you threaten no one. It is completely true that you threaten no one. Nonetheless, you feel either you are in danger or that you are the danger. It is a retort designed not to contain, but open and shut like a valve. A space between entrance and egress, pressure and release. A moment of pure supplication, a revelation of true marrow and meaning, hiatus, opening, rupture, fissure, gap. A room close to nothing, the reinforced shell of its nothing. Who here cannot help but think of a plump fly bumping against a window? A fly who believes something will give. Something does. A buzzer. Then juice through the wire. And the latches slide in, slide out. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank that you. That was wonderful. Thank you for these questions, and thank you for the chance to talk with you about these poems.